the center, uh, Ambassador Jack Matlock uh, and his wife, uh, 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 Ian and I and several other faculty members uh, had the pleasure of meeting Ambassador Matlock in Spasso House in Moscow in uh, March 1991, at a time when Mikhail Gorbachev was attempting to hold the Union together, uh, and right around the time of the Union Treaty. A group of us went with the, the delusion, one might say, of giving lectures on democracy, federalism, and other such topics uh, to an institute run by the Central Committee. Um, we uh, enjoyed and learned a great deal from uh, our uh, talk with Ambassador Matlock uh, at that time. Uh, uh, he is here today to uh, give the first of four lectures in the Henry Stimson uh, lecture series which is named for uh, a Yale graduate in the class of 1888, who became a Secretary of War under William Howard Taft, later Secretary of State under Herbert Hoover, and then again in 1940, uh, Secretary of War under Franklin uh, Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, for some time now, the Center has been sponsoring uh, Stimson Lectures, and it's a pleasure for us uh, to do this this year uh, and to have Ambassador Matlock here. Uh, he uh, entered the Foreign Service uh, after studying Russian and in fact after teaching <coughs> Russian uh, at Dartmouth College for two or three years uh, and had a long career in the Foreign Service uh, and served on several occasions in Moscow beginning in the early 60s when he was a I believe a council and uh, vice council and a third secretary and in fact during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 uh, he was one of the people translating the uh, telegrams that were going back and forth between JFK and Nikita Khrushchev. Um, he uh, spent some time uh, in Africa in various embassies in Africa and then returned to uh, Washington and uh, was the director uh, for Soviet uh, affairs in the State Department. Uh, spent time as the uh, uh, for four years uh, in the 1970s as a counselor and the deputy chief of mission BCM in Moscow. Uh, in 1981, uh, he became the chargé d'affaires and the acting ambassador in uh, Moscow and was also appointed as the ambassador uh, to Czechoslovakia. Uh, two years later, uh, he was uh, asked by President Reagan to return to Washington uh, to become a special assistant to the president uh, and uh, the senior director for European and Russian affairs in the National Security Council. And he held that position in three years and during that time was uh, intimately involved in the negotiations and the summits between Reagan and Gorbachev and the negotiations over uh, nuclear weapons and the reduction of nuclear weapons. In 1987, uh, he was appointed uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union uh, and spent four years uh, in Moscow as ambassador, uh, leaving shortly before um, the demise of the Soviet Union as a territorial entity, to use the language from the Minsk Declaration. Uh, since his retirement, uh, Ambassador uh, Matlock uh, has taught at several colleges. Uh, in fact, he just came today from having taught yesterday uh, at Hamilton College. Um, he's written uh, extensively about American foreign policy, about uh, the Soviet Union, and about post-Soviet uh, Russia. From 1991 to 1996, he was the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor in the Practice of International Diplomacy at Columbia University. Uh, and for five years after that, he was the George Kennan uh, Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, at Princeton. And during that period, he wrote uh, two very important books, one the magisterial uh, Autopsy on an Empire, 
an account of his years as ambassador of, uh, in the Soviet Union in 87 to 91. Uh, and more recently, he wrote um, a book uh, entitled Gor Reagan and Gorbachev, How the Cold War Ended, which is the best account I've seen of the negotiations uh, pertaining to nuclear weapons um, during the Reagan presidency. Uh, and he's uh, still writing books. Uh, in fact, he has um, a book uh, that will be coming out shortly. And these lectures uh, will be a separate book that will be published by Yale University Press uh, next year. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome to New Haven, to Yale, and to the center uh, Ambassador Jack Matlock. Uh, today he will be speaking about misunderstanding Russia, East, West, sui generis. Uh, tomorrow at the same time, uh, at 4, he'll be speaking about the 90s, meaning the 90s in Russia, democracy or disarray. And then on Wednesday, uh, February 10th, he'll be speaking about Vladimir Putin's Russia. And he'll conclude the lectures on February 11th. Uh, speaking on living with Russia, prospects for the future. So it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Ambassador Matlock. Thank you very much, Professor Cameron. <clears throat> and I must say that it is a very great honor to come here and particularly to deliver a lecture, uh, lectures in a series um, dedicated to Henry Stimson, I think was one of the great statesmen of uh, the first half of the 20th century. And he was, of course, aside from all of his other achievements, he was uh, Secretary of War during uh, the Second World War and immediately after. Now, in these four lectures or talks, I think of them myself a little less formally than that, uh, about America and Russia, <clears throat> I have selected a number of, most of them are well-known quotations over oh, the last nearly 200 years that have been made about Russia or about U.S.-Russian relations. I hope everybody had a chance to get a copy on the way in, because I will be referring to them. Um, but I would call your attention to the one from Henry Stimson, a comment he made to President Truman in 1945, just a few months uh, uh, as the war in Europe was ending. And it was that we must find a way of persuading Russia to play ball. He was thinking about the post-World War II world and how it was going to work out if Russia didn't cooperate. Well, the Soviet Union, and as I will be mentioning later, I think we do have to make a distinction. The Soviet Union at that time was ruled by a man named Joseph Stalin. And Stalin, for many reasons, it had nothing to do with Russian national interest as such, was totally unwilling to play ball or to cooperate with the West. Um, but that theme, the fact that we are not going to be able to put together, you might say, a peaceful and constructive world without cooperation with Russia. That the idea behind Stimson's uh, comment to Truman, I think, is still true. And I would say that quotation is one I will be discussing in greater detail in the fourth of these talks. <coughs> as of today, as I look back, uh, and uh, being reminded during uh, uh, Professor Cameron's introduction of some of my own experiences, I would have to say that I am definitely not a prophet. And though in the last lecture I will try to talk a little bit about what the contours of the future might be, I'm not going to try to predict. <clears throat> 
I was often asked, particularly during my last tour in Moscow as the Soviet Union was democratizing and beginning to come apart, I was often asked by Soviet citizens, uh, what do you think is going to happen? You know, will this happen or that happen? And I had a stock answer. I would say, look, I don't really know what's going to happen. Now, when it happens, I'll be very happy to explain why it was inevitable. <laughs> because when you look back, you sort of assume that, well, this was the only way things could have gone. But when you look forward, you have to bear in mind that there are a few such certainties. And that was certainly my case when I was asked by President Reagan to go to Moscow as ambassador. I knew it was going to be a tough time. I hoped it would be a time of change and where we could improve the relationship. But you know, and I hoped that I could retire and have a, uh, an active life even after that. But it never occurred to me that I, when I retired, the country to which I was accredited would not be a country anymore. And it certainly didn't occur to me that they were going to have to replace me with 15 ambassadors. But that too happened. So my view of the future is one where uh, it's better to wait until it's past, and then your uh, things can be clearer. And in these lectures, I will be trying to look at things that happened in the past that have a relevance uh, to us today and which we tend need to have in mind. Because right now, Russia is getting a very bad press. And indeed, relations between the United States and Russia are, one would think, particularly reading by the various reports, as bad, well, I would say worse than they have been at any time since the Soviet Union broke up. Um, we've even begun to hear that we may be entering a new Cold War. In fact, Edward Lucas, the economist correspondent in Eastern Europe, has published a book of that title, The New Cold War, Putin's Russia, and the Threat to the West. Even after that book was published, we had the shocks of the Russian invasion of Georgia last uh, August, and cries that uh, obviously uh, Russia seems to be intent upon reassembling the Soviet Union using imperialist methods. And even more recently, we had a couple of weeks when gas supplies that were passing f from and through Russia, through Ukraine, to Europe, uh, the rest of Europe, uh, were shut down. Uh, was Russia playing politics, playing power politics with the gas supply? Um, Many people seem to think so. Others would say, hey, this is a, this is a squabble between Russia and Ukraine primarily, uh, and one in which uh, neither of them have played it very well. And I could go on and on, of course, about uh, some of these negative things. And uh, in my third lecture, I will go on to them in, in greater detail. But today, I want to look back and think in a rather broader terms of the way we think about Russia. There certainly are genuine problems today in uh, U.S. relations with Russia. And some recent trends within Russia uh, raise genuine concern regarding their effect on Russia's future. No question about that, that Putin's Russia has grown more authoritarian, uh, has shown less respect for human rights uh, than even uh, Gorbachev did in his final year. Uh, there are a number of negative trends. Uh, nevertheless, I feel that much of the talk about Russia's threat to the rest of the world has ignored the context in which these developments have occurred. The context in which and the historical background uh, uh, that happened uh, before uh, these changes occurred within Russia and in Russia's followers. In particular, there seems to be a disconnect between those who comment on what has happened internally in Russia recently and the comment on how the United States and 
Western European countries treated Russia, the sort of precedents they set in the 90s and also going in uh, to the early 21st century. Now, um, they, these quotations, again, uh, that I have here, all of them except perhaps the one uh, that I cited from Henry Stimson, uh, are very well known, very common. You have the de Tocqueville uh, prediction at the end of his first, uh, uh, his first volume on democracy in America that Russia and America, or North America, the Anglo-Americans, as he put it, would between them, coming from different directions, each hold the fate of half the world in their hands. And wasn't that, in fact, the idea people had when they spoke of the bipolar world, when they spoke of the East-West split during the Cold War. Um, I'll be coming on that later because uh, I, I think that although this idea was very widespread, it had serious faults. And then we have the famous uh, quotation, often repeated quotation from Winston Churchill, I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia it is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Now Churchill said that just a few days after he learned about the Nazi-Soviet pact. Suddenly, after months, indeed years, of negotiation with Stalin, the Soviet Union, to form a united front against Germany, suddenly Stalin signs a treaty with Hitler. But was it Russia that Churchill didn't understand, or was it Stalin? Did he not understand that for Stalin, an agreement with Churchill and the French is exactly the same as an agreement with Hitler? They were all class enemies. It was divide and rule. And you would make temporary alliances with one or the other, but you would make the alliance with the one that would give you the most, at least temporarily. And Hitler was willing to give Stalin a big hunk of Central Europe. Britain was not willing to sacrifice Polish independence to the alliance. Again, what is mysterious about this? <laughs> uh, I would stress, this was Stalinism. This was Stalin. This was the communist idea. It was not necessarily Russia in a national sense. Then one can ask, and I'll have more to say about this later, well, how do the Russians view these things? And typically, if we go back to the 19th century, Russian opinion tended to be split between the Slavophiles and what they call the Westernizers. The Westernizers feeling that Russia's future was to go along the lines they saw operating in Western Europe, which was increasingly toward, uh, I would say, more democracy, uh, rule of law, uh, less autocracy, whereas the Slavophiles rejected that, saying that the Russian soul and the Russian church, the Russian body politic, uh, was simply not subject to these sort of rational uh, uh, measures uh, that the Westernizers and the people in Western Europe, whom they observed, wanted to apply. And we have the very famous poem by Fyodor Tyutchev, which ends with uh, the line, Vrasiu. In Russia, one can only believe. Before that, he says that the, you, there is no common measure. You can't measure Russia or judge Russia by what he would have called Western standards. Uh, clearly, this is also associated uh, with a theme 
and I'll talk about this later. Anyway, uh, I will be returning to these quotations, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't, but all of them, uh, all of them give us a chance to think about how the rest of the world has thought about Russia. Now, I think one of the most distorting approaches has been the way we tend, or many people tend, first of all, to put these questions in, they sometimes in an east-west. The east is this, the west is this, or Europe, Asia, uh, or you know, the, uh, the Occidental, the Oriental, Russia always being you know, on that Oriental side. Well, obviously, geographically, uh, Russia lies to the east of the rest of Europe. Uh, but except in that sense, these dichotomies, and uh, they uh, are usually, in my opinion, quite overdrawn. Um, another one would be autocracy on the one hand, democracy on the other. And the problem, I have several problems with this sort of, of analysis that, uh, that has a conflicting dichotomy. Uh, first of all, uh, it supports an assumption that these are opposites and are inevitably in conflict. And that means that you tend to beatify one and demonize the other and ignore a lot of the detail, the relevant detail in between. This attitude in general, and not just toward Russia, but uh, sort of dividing the world between the good guys and the bad guys, uh, uh, William Pfaff, the columnist uh, you, you, uh, you often see in the Herald Tribune, um, has called the infantile political manichaeism. And I think, I think that really states it pretty well. Uh, and uh, as I said, it applies not only to Russia, but particularly to Russia. Uh, after all, when we hear, well, you know, Ukraine really wants to be in NATO because they want to be part of the West. Well, the Ukrainian president does want membership in NATO, but uh, why put it quite in those terms? Uh, I'll go into greater detail uh, in that, uh, but uh, on, on these special issues. But my point here is that often it sets up a contrast much more stark uh, than reality. The second problem I have uh, with this sort of either or, east, west, autocracy or democracy, uh, sort of thing is that it really takes the issues that it applies to out of historical context. Uh, you get into almost the infernal question, is Russia Europe or not? And I'd like to discuss that a little more because there's so many approaches that one sees that uh, treats Russia as and this is true in Russia as well, as something sort of different from the rest of Europe. And yet, uh, whether, uh, however you look at Russia, particularly since the, uh, from the 18th century on, they've been an intimate part of Europe, both European politics, European culture, uh, and this has gone both ways. I mean, uh, how can, you know, how can one study the modern novel without studying Tolstoy or Dostoevsky? How can one think of modern drama without knowing something about Chekhov? Uh, and, and so on. Uh, how about the dance, uh, <laughs> ballet, the theater, uh, Stanislavski technique? You know, you can, if this isn't part of European culture, what is? Now, uh, so, in a certain sense, the idea that Russia has been separate from Europe and not really part of it. Now, of course, Russia, like any other country, has its unique aspects. And, of course, it also has Asian territories, uh, territories that uh, run east of the Urals. But basically, its culture uh, has been 
uh, has been formed historically uh, from the beginnings of the Russian state in Europe. After all, the first Russian state was uh, created by Vikings who came from Scandinavia and went down the river system. And these were the first, the first Russian law is very similar to the early Anglo-Saxon and the Lex Salica of the Germanic peoples. So, you know, back to early medieval times, uh, essentially Russian culture was part of Europe and I think it has been uh, since. Of course, you did have periods uh, during the Mongol conquest, for example, when uh, Russia was under the sway of the Mongols. They were never totally occupied. And yet, we never questioned that Spain is a European country and Spain sit much longer under uh, the, uh, the, the Moorish uh, occupation. Uh, and I think it's in, actually, its culture has probably been more influenced uh, by Islam than, than Russian has. So each of these uh, uh, things, I think, uh, it simply distorts the history if you push it too far. And then finally, on this dichotomy, uh, when we look at a current issue, we often simply ignore the environment, including the historical precedents in which the negative changes occurred. Now, how many of us, when we heard that uh, Russia had invaded Georgia uh, in the enclave South Ossetia last August, how many were told that the struggle there began before Georgia was totally independent when the Georgians attacked the South Ossetians and tried to, deny, uh, and, tried to and did withdraw the autonomy that they had had in the Soviet Union and tried to force upon them, uh, 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 you might say, to, they tried to do to the South Ossetians and later the people in Abkhazia what they accuse the Russians of doing to them, that is, uh, to dominate them uh, and, in effect, to treat them as uh, uh, without any rights for their own ethnic existence. Um, I think, finally, uh, uh, Harab English, uh, a professor at UCLA, wrote an article in the New York Review of Books because he was in Georgia in 1990 and 91 when this was going on. But most of the news reporters, you would have thought, well, this was simply a matter of Russia suddenly marches into Georgia. Uh, you sort of lose, and I would say in this case, uh, none of the players in that particular drama comes out with clean hands. I'm not trying to excuse Russia, but I'm simply saying that we, when we are given a snapshot of what happens without the background of all the factors that go behind it, and then we make one side uh, have all of the right and the other side all of the wrong, we tend to make some serious mistakes. So uh, I think that another question that we need to clear up in our minds, and it's one that I think simply because of our use of language tends to get confused at times. And that is, well, what is Russia? What are we referring to when we say Russia? Now, when Henry Stimson told Truman, you know, we've got to make, we've got to persuade Russia to play ball, he was talking about the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union is not the same as the Russia we talk about today, uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, the Soviet Union was a communist empire. It was run within the Russian Federation largely by ethnic Russians, but not entirely. After all, Stalin was not even an ethnic Russian. Uh, they, uh, I would say the most destructive of their dictators, he was a Georgian. Uh, and in the other republics, you increasingly, after World War II, had the republics run by people of that nationality. Uh, and that's why many Russian nationalists back in the late Soviet period were trying to bring down the Soviet Union because they said, you know, 
these communists are treating Russia like a colony. That, and that uh, the communist state, and indeed, one of the goals of the Soviet Union was to create a new Soviet man, a person without a nationality, but with the characteristics of simply a good citizen of a multinational state. Um, so when we talk about what Russia does or what Russian governments do, which is more appropriate, we really have to bear in mind which government we're talking about. And in the last hundred years, Russia has existed in at least four distinct political forms. You had Tsarism up until 1917, and there the, you know, the basic bywords for that rule was autocracy, orthodoxy, and then a word in Russian that is sometimes translated nationalism, but narodnost is not what we normally mean when we say nationalism. It really has to do the spirit of the people. Um, so you had the czar, the church, and essentially the peasantry, because narodnost referred mainly to, the, to that. Um, for a very brief period, you had the embryo parliamentary democracy uh, during the provisional government in 1917. Uh, the government that was destroyed by the impact of World War I and uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. And then we had the Communist Empire, which I think it was, although the, the Soviet leaders, particularly from World War II on, began to assume many of the attitudes of the earlier czarist period, particularly as regards foreign policy. Nevertheless, it was essentially a communist empire and one that was run by the Communist Party the way a criminal organization controls a front government. If you get an organized crime in a city or maybe part of a city, uh, they can bribe the police, they probably own the mayor by uh, their electoral shenanigans, and sort of conduct their business uh, through that. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union treated the Soviet state as a front organization. They had what they would call the famous telephone law, where judges, or plant managers or whatever would follow the orders they received from, uh, from uh, the party uh, secretary or the, the party official that was assigned to supervise that particular organization. Um, then finally, we have the Russian Federation of today. Um, Tsarist Russia, The Soviet Union were both very large empires. The Russian Federation has less than half the people that the Soviet Union did when it collapsed, though it still occupies vast stretches of territory. Uh, and yet, it also has a population, and I'll be mentioning this later, the impact, which is declining. Um, it is now down to, I think, about 145 million. The Soviet Union had around 300 million when, uh, when it broke up, and close to half went to the Russian Federation, but uh, that population has been declining ever since. You have what is now a formal democracy, but one which, uh, um, which is, has much more autocratic uh, practices uh, than you would find in, in, in a liberal democracy. On the other hand, you have a government that at least until the last few months was running at about 70% popularity. So you have to start wondering, well, how do you define democracy? Is it a government that 
most people are satisfied with? Or is it one that people control? Uh, and in this case, the people clearly don't control the government. On the other hand, uh, at least until the, this, uh, the low oil prices and uh, the financial meltdown has affected Russia, and it is affecting them uh, severely, uh, President Putin was extremely popular, and uh, so is his successor, Medvedev. Well, I've talked before a bit about is Russia Europe or is it something else? And uh, the problem there is that often, whether or not one says there's a lot of that Russia has been part of the European state system, Russian culture is part of Europe and all of that. Normally when one uses the term today, you equate Europe with democracy and rule of law, market economics, and, and when you find some of those things missing, you get again uh, the application of this uh, dichotomy that Russia is somehow east and different from the good West uh, in Europe. Um, there's no question in my mind, looking at it historically, that many of the characteristics that we find in Western Europe today spread gradually West to East over the centuries. Um, things like representative government, uh, the abolition of serfdom even before that, and so on. You have, uh, and uh, Martin Malia, uh, the late historian uh, at Berkeley, who wrote about this a lot, uh, coined the, firm, uh, the term, or maybe he borrowed it, I learned it from him, the cultural gradient, where he pointed out that many things, and one of the things he looked at was the liberation of serfs, serfdom would move west to east within each sort of band of liberation 40 to 50 years apart. And he points out that the last uh, laws uh, limiting uh, serfs in Prussia occurred around 1811. And of course, the serfs were freed in Russia about 50 years later in 1861. And, um, uh, Ernst Gellner, the sociologist, made much the same point when he talked about the movement of, democ of democracy as it moved from Western Europe uh, into Central Europe, and the idea being that uh, it is likely uh, to move into Russia that way. Frankly, we still don't know, because one of the things that I think we have to understand is that Again, a lot of things can happen that change these tendencies. And, and when we begin to think about the sort of things that happened in Russia after the Soviet Union collapsed, and that's my subject tomorrow, uh, you can begin to see that it's not a straightforward process uh, the development of democracy, the development of representative government. Because despite the fact we often hear everybody wants freedom, you know, I think that's true if people have enough to eat and feel reasonably secure. But suppose you're starving. And suppose you live in a crime-ridden neighborhood. Do you think about freedom first, or do you think about survival? And one of the problems I have with the sort of indices that we are kept by Freedom House, which are very useful in some respects, is that they don't tell you anything about the economics, about how people are living, just how much freedom they have. And so to put it on that without looking at whether a given government, whether democratic or not, is meeting the needs as perceived by that society of social support 
and economic support and economic opportunity uh, and providing security. Unless you, you take account to that, I think you're able to get rather distorted views. Another problem that I wanted to point out in our perception of these things uh, it comes from my thoughts about uh, Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. I don't know whether you've had a chance to read that. It was uh, in the 90s. It was uh, sort of obligatory reading for anyone who was thinking about uh, international relations. And uh, Professor Huntington, um, uh, who died a few months ago, and I think we feel his loss, uh, his intellectual loss, very severely, he taught us a lot about the impact of different cultures can have on the behavior. But when he took that and began to theorize, to group it together and theorize, I think he led us a little too far into the abstract. Um, among other things, he spoke of cultures as something almost like nation states, so well organized, with finite boundaries and that there and he predicted that in the future most of the conflict in the world would be on these boundaries of civilizations he defined civilization very much the way arnold toynbee the historian did and that means that he put russia in a different civilization from western europe because toynbee uh, i think rather illogically uh, split Western civilization off the Roman, uh, the Greco-Roman civilization um, because of Christianity. But then when there was the split in the churches between Rome and Constantinople, he said, okay, so you've got an Orthodox civilization and you have a Western Christian civilization. But then he didn't split Western civilization when Protestantism came along. He didn't split Muslim civilization between Shia and Sunni. In other words, some things caused him to split, other things didn't. So he has the Russia in a different civilization from Western Europe because of Russian Orthodoxy, an Orthodox religion. He would put them in the same civilization as modern day Greece and, and the other. Now, the, it's not that these things are different, but you have the irony that people who, if they're religious at all, and many are, they use the same texts <laughs> that other Christians do. Uh, some of the rituals are a bit different, but they pray to the same God uh, and have the same religious text. So if that is the determination, then one wonders why you split. So the reason I make this point is that uh, Toynbee makes a good bit of the argument that Russia belonging in a different civilization will never be, or certainly not in the foreseeable future, uh, be able to have the sort of political system which is more common uh, in Western Europe and North America. He places North America in, in the, the Western uh, civilization. Now, you know, this brings us to, well, what do we mean by Europe? If you look at other historians, and I, uh, I've learned, uh, spent some time reading, you know, the historians in the Annal school, uh, the French group, and particularly Fenon Brodel. Now, Brodel, who wrote a masterly history of the civilizations around the Mediterranean, now he would have divided civilization quite differently from Toynbee. For him, all the countries around the Mediterranean share a civilization. But he commented once, uh, there's no such thing as European civilization. He said, oh, there's a Spanish civilization, there's a French civilization, there's an English civilization, there's a German civilization, and you can define them 
And yes, they interact and so on. But he said, when you make it as broad as Europe, it becomes meaningless because you can no longer define it. Now, he's thinking of culture, of course, not just of politics. But it does seem to me that that is one of the things we need to bear in mind before we go too far in taking these broad generalizations as somehow operative in the present and applicable to uh, current political relations, or for that matter, uh, to the way a country may evolve politically internally. The other side of that coin, of course, I'll go back to the poem by Fyodor Tchutchev, the Slavophiles, uh, they would have very much agreed that Russian Orthodoxy formed a separate civilization and one that is not subject to the sort of criteria that you would apply in Western Europe. Faith alone. You can only believe in Russia. Don't worry about trying to understand it. In fact, the first line of this group of poems was umom rasiyu nyepanyach. By the mind, one cannot understand Russia. Um, so, and you, this idea is very much repeated in Dostoevsky. Implicit in some of his novels, very explicit in his diary of a writer. Uh, and it's very much connected with the Slavophile tradition. Now one of the interesting things, for me at least, is that it was in the westernizer tradition, not the Slavophile tradition, that Marxism came to Russia. So in a sense, communism was based on a West European ideology. I mean, how can you describe it any other way? Um, philosopher from Trier in the Rhineland who writes his magnum opus uh, in England, about as Western as you can get. Um, so philosophically, uh, you know, Marxism itself. <laughs> in fact, I've read some comments by Europeans to say, you know, the problem with the Russians is they take Western ideas and they take them literally. They don't modify them like, say, we did when we came up with, say, a democratic socialism. The Russians take it so literally that they foul it all up. And actually, there maybe is something to that. But the fact is, it, you, you can't really say that Marxism and communism was not a European idea and was not a Western idea. Uh, and uh, these things do tend to get all mixed up. And I think when we generalize too much or assume that simply because Russia has generally had an autocratic government, it is doomed in the future uh, to have one, we make a mistake. I'm running out of time. I'm going to rush on a bit to make some points because I did want to say a few things about Russian relations with the United States. We tended to think during the Cold War about the confrontation. We even talked about a bipolar world as if the two of us ran the world between us, uh, which never was true. But until the early 20th century, the best way to describe U.S.-Russian relations were distant friends. In fact, that I think is one of the titles that Norman Saul, who wrote this multi-volume excellent history, of U.S.-Russian relations uh, used. Um, you know, even in the earliest years of the Republic, when John Quincy Adams uh, was our, uh, um, at that time we didn't have ambassadors, we had ministers uh, in legations, he was our minister to Russia. And he and Alexander, Tsar Alexander, actually became well, perhaps friends is not quite the same. 
he would go out for walks along the embankment when the czar was out and they would chat. Uh, and for political reasons, Russia had a very supportive relationship with the United States, despite the fact that it was a republic. Um, and, you know, this continued through the 19th century. Uh, Russia tended to side with the Union uh, during the Civil War, when Britain had <laughs> real questions there, and so on. Of course, in World War I and World War II, Russia and then the Soviet Union was on the same side we were. In fact, when you think about it, Russia is really the only major country in the world, except maybe France. This is a questionable time when we weren't actually declaring war, but we were actually fighting the French, uh, that we have not had a war with. And that probably tells you something about national interest and whether they conflict or not. Um, now, the relationship was one which broke totally and officially after the Bolshevik Revolution. Not because Russia was Russia, but because it went communist. And because we feared the influence of communists here. The Bolshevik Revolution there and the Civil War in Russia was followed by the Red Scare in the United States. With the arrest of demonstrators and a real fear that this socialist revolution uh, was a danger to us. And of course, until Franklin Roosevelt was elected uh, and then um, uh, established official relations with the Soviet Union in 1933, for over a decade, we had no official relations. Um, the 30s, there was an attempt and unfortunately, uh, the 30s uh, coincided with Stalin's purges, the collectivization, the famines, and so on. But in World War II, we ended up again allies. And I would say one thing as we look at this relationship is that one of the things that we need to bear in mind is that in both countries, there has been, over time, a significant messianic streak. I'll have to put it that way. A feeling that the country had a civilization or values or something which they were obligated to spread and share with the rest of the world, even perhaps impose on the rest of the world. Um, we had our manifest destiny. Um, more recently, uh, we have had our attempt to democratize the Middle East uh, and spread democracy to countries that haven't had it. In Moscow, the idea goes back even further. Uh, just after the fall of Constantinople to the Turks, you had Russian, a Russian runk writing about Moscow, the third Rome. There was Rome, there was Constantinople, and now Moscow as the standard bearer of Christianity. And now, perhaps this idea didn't extend very far outside monastic or um, ecclesiastical circles, but by the 19th century, it got tied up in the whole idea of Pan-Slavism, the ideas that, for example, Dostoevsky uh, uh, understood very well. And Dostoevsky would write passionately in his diary of the writer of how it was the obligation of the Russian Tsar to protect the Christians in the Balkans by liberating Bulgaria, by occupying Constantinople and bringing it back to Christianity. Uh, and it was not to expand Russia, but to protect fellow Christians. Um, you know, I think there is, obviously are, there are differences uh, in, in many respects, but then we have our Wilsonianism. We go to war to make the world safe for democracy, or more recently, to make the world democratic. Um, and this took the form in the Soviet Union that we call the Brezhnev Doctrine. 
if socialism is established somewhere, and they made the assumption that only a socialist country, socialism as they defined it, could be truly friendly and non-threatening to the Soviet Union. And if a socialist government was threatened, it was their obligation to save that government. One of our presidential candidates last fall talked about setting up a League of Democracies, <coughs> apparently on the assumption if you have enough democracies, they're going to be more reliable allies. It does seem to me that there is a mindset here that is somewhat comparable. And we need to, um, it, and it goes beyond expansionism uh, because I think in both cases these ideas have been used for essentially imperialistic purposes, let's be frank. Uh, but there's another side to it, and that is with Russians. Maybe it's because of the Cold War, maybe it, you know, a whole number of reasons, but the only other country that really counts in terms of their policies is the United States. I was once asked by George Schultz when we were, after we were negotiating some pretty tough issues and we were riding out to the airport in Moscow and he said, tell me, Jack, what do you think these Russians really want? And I said, they want to be more like us. And they want acceptance. And almost acceptance has to come first. You find, in, whether it's in the Slavophiles or the others, the feeling of inferiority. And once they begin to feel inferiority to the rest, then that's when they go off on, we don't need your standards, we have soul. We are right, we represent the true Christianity or whatever. When in their hearts they want to be treated as we treat the Europeans, but a little better than we treat the Europeans because they see themselves as a great people and the only other great country that they want to emulate is the United States. And, and, and that gives for the average Russian relations with the United States a piquancy and a relevance we don't have toward Russia. We come with different attitudes and different mi mindsets when we look at it. Many of our citizens whose ancestors, uh, forefathers, and not too many generations ago came from Russia, came out because of oppression. They remember the Cossacks and the pogroms and so on, and this is Russia. And it was wasn't all of Russia. So we both have, in a sense, in the case of Russians, I would say sort of a love-hate relationship in the sense that, well, if you don't accept me, then, you know, you must be my enemy. Uh, and you'll get very great variation one way or the other. Uh, here in the United States, it's a little hard, really, politically to uh, to convince people that it's really important for us to try to understand uh, where the Russians are coming from because we need them also in a number of ways. It seems to me that as the Cold War ended, three geopolitically seismic events occurred. Now, Vladimir Putin has been quoted as having said not too long ago and more than once, the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century was the breakup of the Soviet Union. And people who quote that usually don't quote another of his sayings, which he has said even more often, and that is, you know, anybody who does not regret the collapse of the Soviet Union has no heart. Anybody who would reconstitute it has no brain. Um, the fact that he considers the collapse of the Soviet Union a geopolitical disaster is probably explainable by Russia's experience in the 90s, which I'll be talking about tomorrow. 
But in fact, the Cold War ended before the Soviet Union collapsed. I think three things occurred that were so significant geopolitically that they may be comparable to the drift of continents in geological time. They certainly remade the geopolitical map. First was the end of the Cold War, which essentially ended that east-west, literal east-west struggle, basically over ideology. And in, in my opinion, the ideological Cold War ended in December 1988, when Gorbachev made a speech at the United Nations in which he not only said that they were going to reduce their military unilaterally by half a million, but he also made the significant statement that there is no limitation on the freedom of choice that a country has about its political system. Now, this is a renunciation of the Brezhnev doctrine, a renunciation of the right to intervene, to keep socialism, and a renunciation of the foundation principle of Soviet foreign policy up till then, which was based on the assumption of an international class struggle. He dropped that. And indeed, the next year, when he put forward theses for the Communist Party conference, principles, there was not a hint of Marxism in those theses. It was almost as if they were cribbed, partly from the American Declaration of Independence and partly from the American Constitution. Um, and these, you, by 89, no, those theses were already in 88. By 89, they were being fulfilled with contested elections, and so on. So when the Cold War ended, it ended by negotiation. We did not force the Soviet Union to end the Cold War. Gorbachev ended the Cold War because it was in his interest to end it. He didn't made no concessions that were not in his country's interest. Uh, we didn't ask him to do anything that was not in his country's interest if the country was willing to live in peace with other countries. This was one thing Ronald Reagan understood. And he would say when we were developing our negotiating plans, you can't ask them to do something that's against their interest. But most of the things they're doing are also against their interests, and we have to persuade them of that. Their domination of Eastern Europe was creating uh, countries that hated them. The people did because of the way they controlled them. Uh, so the Cold War ended not so much as a victory. It certainly was not a military victory. It was ended by negotiation to the benefit of both parties. Now, having ended, it made it possible for Gorbachev to begin very fundamental reforms in the Soviet Union. He could not have pursued those reforms if the Cold War had continued because the international tensions were such that one of the first things he had to do was to put more resources into the civilian economy. It was being robbed by the military industrial complex. And, and yet, as long as there was the tensions and the Cold War, how politically could you begin to cut back on that? You, 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 you had to end that first. And as once the Cold War and the arms race was over, he felt free to try to reform the country in a fundamental way. And when he saw that the Communist Party cadres, the professionals, were beginning to block these reforms, he decided he had to take the Communist Party out of power. It was not Western pressure that brought down communism in the Soviet Union. I was really outraged when 
Ronald Reagan died and the cover of The Economist magazine had the headline, The Man Who Beat Communism. Reagan himself would never have put it that way. In fact, he puts in his memoirs that the end of the Cold War was not a victory of one country over the other. It was a victory of one idea over any other. And it occurred when the other side understood the ideas. In other words, was reforming. Um, communism was brought down in the Soviet Union by Mikhail Gorbachev. And he was the only man who could have done it. But he couldn't have done it if the Cold War was still on. Having taken the Communist Party out of total control over the country, then all the various inequities, pressures that had been suppressed in the Soviet Union suddenly came to the fore. And Gorbachev, one of his principles was he made a lot of political mistakes, but he was simply against try, uh, solving political problems by force. So he rejected all the ideas that he should put down these uh, things by force. And eventually, it was these pressures within the Soviet Union that brought it down. The United States tried to prevent that from happening. One of the myths today, and particularly true in Russia, is that we brought down the Soviet Union. Nonsense. They did it to themselves, and they did it with our president, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, the first President Bush, doing his best to support Gorbachev effort to establish a voluntary federation of all the republics except the three Baltic countries. We always considered them as having the right to independence and uh, thought they should be liberated. But we did not want to see 12 independent countries with nuclear weapons. And for a while there were nuclear weapons in most of them, and that wasn't the only factor. The fact was that by 1991, the Soviet Union was a different entity than the one it had been before. It was changing even before that, and you know, Ronald Reagan was well known for having said in one of his speeches, and I think only one, he referred to an evil empire. But then when he visited Moscow in May of 88, and he was asked, is this still the evil empire? And he said, well, no, that was another time, another era. Things were changing. He was recognizing it. And you know what those of us who were living there and in contact, I had a staff that really we knew the opposition and the communist leaders in all of the republics. Uh, and they stayed in contact with us. And it was very clear that the democratic opposition in most of the countries outside the Baltic states were being supported by Moscow and were alive only because of that. And of course, when the Soviet Union broke up, when it did, we found in Central Asia, every one of them either were left in the hands of the communist uh, uh, dictator, that's be fine, that was there before, except Tajikistan, which then had a civil war. Um, so in 91, we really, that is, we American officials, the government from the president on down, did all we could to support Gorbachev's effort to create a democratic and voluntary federation. Bush made a memorable speech in Kiev, uh, August 1st, 1991. It was made to the Ukrainian parliament, but we told the press in our briefings that this is directed at all the non-Russian nationalities. The speech became a bit infamous when Bill Sapphire, the columnist, called it his Chicken Kiev speech. Now, why was it a Chicken Kiev speech? Because he endorsed Gorbachev's Union Treaty. And he said two things that I think Sapphire either didn't understand or didn't refer to. He said, do not confuse freedom and independence. They are not synonymous. Choose freedom 
And number two, he said, avoid suicidal nationalism. What do you have in mind? Georgia, because Gamsakurdia was conducting, in effect, a war in South Ossetia already. And it was apparent to that administration where that was going to lead if it continued. Well, I think one can say, in retrospect, the Soviet Union was unsalvageable. Even if Gorbachev had put together a union treaty, maybe it wouldn't have lasted very long. But the fact is that the idea that somehow the United States, using its military force and its economic might, brought so much pressure to bear on Gorbachev that he had to end the Cold War, brought so much pressure to bear that it ended communism in the Soviet Union and then broke up the Soviet Union, which was in our national interest, gets almost every one of those propositions wrong. And yet those ideas have become part of the mythology which you will see treated time and time again. And I'm going to return to some of these ideas in later lectures, but I think I've talked enough for this afternoon. <laughs>